matters incredibly. The, the, the left has actually in some ways abandoned classic Marxist division by class and now made it by race. Uh, but uh, race was neither left nor right until the, the, this moment. It is not a right-wing value. I mean, I, uh, I live among people on the right. None, none, none of them, not one, not, a, not one person I know is a racist. I bet, totally. They find the idea preposterous. You may remember Patriot Front from this video, for example. It made the rounds years ago, 2021, where they were marching on the Capitol. I went through who Patriot Front was at the time. Uh, so I don't I don't want to get into that, but I want to talk about fascism because they are like the quintessential example of fascism. And I found this video from Dennis Prager and uh, Prager, you Dinesh D'Souza specifically talking about fascism and what it is exactly and claiming it's a left wing position. So let's talk about it precisely. Before we talk about fascism, let's talk about the left and the right. How are those defined? I'm going to list some really over-the-top, hyperbolic examples of what the right is and what the left is so that we can kind of at least define the spectrum. So these are things that I hope everyone can agree on. The furthest right that you can possibly get is an obsession with law and order, an obsession with patriotism, with traditionalism or maintaining social norms, looking back to and reaching for a mythical past, being hyper-religious, being super obsessed with toughness and alpha males and war, having no social programs, lower taxes, uh, being in favor of centralized power or authority, superiority in your race or your religious denomination or your country or whatever. It's all about superiority, exceptionalism and opposition to mixing races or mixing denominations of Christianity or whatever. Everything has to be very uniform. That's kind of like a hyperbolic extreme version of the right when I think of it. And as far as the left goes, um, you know, I'm, I'm pulling a lot of this from the original definitions from the French Revolution, but hyperbolic example of left wingers, atheist um, thinkers, academics in touch with their sensitive side, organized protesting unions and democracy and in an ideal world in an extreme far left mindset at utopia people wouldn't have to work or they wouldn't receive pay they would just receive what they needed from the government entirely and they would do the job that they're best suited for right so we need to like look at the characteristics of fascism and see where those fit in fascism was originally popularized in italy in the 1920s and 30s, I think, Mussolini, dude on the left, top left here, was the leader of the fascist party. It was like the name of the political party, the fascist party. And it was characterized by patriotic mottos, slogans, symbols, songs, flags. They had like a, a weird obsession with all of these things. Uh, Nazi party was also fascist, but it was like a different form of fascist. It was still fascist, though. Human rights can be ignored because of fear of enemies and the need for security. As a result, people tend to look the other way when human rights are denied, approve of torture, approve of long incarcerations of prisoners, retribution rather than rehabilitation, uh, approve of executions and assassinations. People are rallied into a unifying patriotic frenzy over the need to eliminate a perceived common enemy. Racial enemies, ethnic or religious minorities, liberals, communists, socialists, terrorists, so on and so forth. These are like key aspects of fascism, right? And we can see an example of fascism in Patriot Front. I don't know if you guys saw the opening to the Olympic Games. Um, they're really serious about copyright violations and stuff. So I'm just going to play like a second of it, but... This is supposed to be Dionysus, 2024 Olympic Games. It's a Greek god, you know, because it's the Olympics. It's like, you know, it's all based around the Greek gods. So they depict a Greek god singing here. Yeah. 
Anyway, yeah. So it, it kind of goes on like that. Dude is apparently naked, but he's not actually completely naked, obviously. That was the Olympic ceremony, and people absolutely lost their minds over it. Said they were making fun of the Last Supper and everything. They weren't. But those same right-wing extremists who complained about this one absolutely loved this one from China, Beijing. And then there's that absolute obsession with toughness. Now watch this. By the way, this symbol on their flags, this is Patriot Front. This is the fascist party logo, basically, from Italy in the 1920s and 30s. So they're pretty openly fascist. Watch this video here. <laughs> Yeah, another thing, another feature of fascism is populism. It's this thing where they talk about helping the common man, just the worker, the average guy. They try to appeal to that demographic, and it, it works every time. Nazi Party was appealing to the average worker. These people are talking about suited criminals taking care of people or taking advantage of people, you know, uh, vengeful scores of bureaucrats and so on and so forth. Yeah. You know, everybody can agree that that's an issue, that people are taking advantage of others on a mass scale like that. But it's the style of speech that they're using, the um, the rhetoric style, populism. Hitler had the exact same style. And uh, Trump has the same style also. And Bernie Sanders had the same style. So it can be used for good or bad, but it is a key feature of fascism every single time. See how uniform they are, how absolutely the, exactly the same they are. Populist language. This is stuff that pretty much everybody can agree with. Big companies take advantage of other people. Absolutely. But they're trying to get the common man on board with this. That guy, by the way, uh, this dude right here, Thomas Rousseau is his name. I don't know if you guys remember that Charlottesville protest forever ago where uh, a bunch of like Nazis were walking around saying Jews will not replace us or something like that. I mean, absolutely insane stuff, right? That group was called, is it American Vanguard? Vanguard America. I knew I was close. Yeah, Vanguard America is the name of it. Full blown Nazis. Well, Thomas Rousseau, I think is his name right here. This guy was the leader of the Texas chapter of Vanguard America, and he basically did like a hostile takeover of the group and kicked the leader out of all of it and renamed it to Patriot Front. So he is a full-blown Nazi. Where is it Justice! There's an anarchist book fair inside the building, he says. Um, another key feature is a violence. It's very much just violence. And um, holding book burnings and whatever it takes ends justify the means mentality to accomplish your goals, period. Whatever it takes. Here's the, the alpha male you know, strength uh, projection that they're trying to give us here, too. They're showing how tough they are. They get like self-proclaimed fascists. They have the fascist symbol in their logo. This is fascism, if anybody wondered. Yeah, so fascist propaganda right there. Now, 
Dinesh D'Souza decided to do a video about fascism and claims that it's left wing. So I want to talk about Dinesh D'Souza's breakdown of fascism because it, it's absolutely absurd. Before we watch it, one more thing. Let me just like go through a little bit more of this. Supremacy of the military, another key feature of fascism. The military is given a disproportionate amount of government funding. Soldiers in military service are glamorized. Widespread sexism. The government tends to be almost exclusively male-dominated. Traditional gender roles are made more rigid. Divorce, abortion, and homosexuality are suppressed. The media is directly or indirectly controlled by the government. Censorship is very common. Here's a picture of um, a Nazi book burning, probably the most famous one. Obsession with national security. Fear is used as a motivational tool by the government over the masses. All about fear. It's all about fear. Fear that somebody's coming to get you. Fear that immigrants are trying to infiltrate your system and take control of it. That was um, Germany's whole complaint that Jews were, well, Jews were the immigrants at the time. Complaint was that the immigrants, the Jews, had worked their way to the top of society and nobody knew who they were. They blended in. You couldn't tell who was who. And they had taken the reins of control and gotten a bunch of people killed, blah, blah, blah. That's uh, the kind of one of the, the key tenets here. And in America, you can see the same exact thing. Immigrants are doing a, a mass invasion on our border. I'm sure you've probably heard that. Yeah, yeah. OK, I do have a clip of this. This is from the Project 2025 training videos. If you haven't seen this, I have some videos on it. But make no mistake, the current mass illegal immigration we are seeing as a result of the Biden administration's intentional actions is not migration, and these people are not migrants. It is an orchestrated invasion being led by the Biden administration in conjunction with the Mexican cartels. Fear, fear, fear. It's all about fear. Scare people. Keep them pumped up with fear at any cost. Religion and government are intertwined. Governments use the most common religion in the nation as a tool to manipulate public opinion. Religious messages and terminology are common from government leaders. In Germany, during the, the Nazi rule, that, that form of fascism, there were two primary religions in the region. There was the Catholic Church and the German Protestant Church, also known as the German Evangelical Church. Collectively, it, it was made up of, it was a federation of, of different churches, and it was almost entirely Lutheran with some Reformed Church members. Uh, which is like a Calvinist denomination. And the churches in each town kind of controlled the government in the town. There was no separation of church and state there. And Hitler had to use the church to make his way to the top. He couldn't have done it without getting the church on his side. So he'd give them little wins if they wanted. Like the Catholics, the Pope agreed to some things, said that he would swear an oath of loyalty to Hitler and he'd have all his bishops do it and everything. If he would do a few things, he would leave them alone and let them worship the way they want to worship. And he would not mess with Catholic schools. People could continue going to them. And also if he would ban Jehovah's Witnesses because they've been talking shit about Catholics for like ever. And that's what he did. There is no separation between the two in a fascist system. Also, centralized power is a key feature rather than democracy. Religious messages and terminology are common from government leaders. Here we go. The German, the German Christians enthusiastically supported Nazi propaganda and sought to join church and state. To further this end, they wanted to join the 28 regional churches of the German Evangelical Church into a national Reich church. Reich Bishop Ludwig Muller. That's true. And they succeeded. They did. They, they joined it all into a Reich church led by Ludwig Muller. 18,000 pastors in the Protestant movement. That does not include free churches like Methodists or Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever. We're talking specifically Lutheran or Reformed Church. 18,000 pastors. 2,000 of them split off from the Reich Church when Ludwig Muller, a Nazi, took control of it. And I think 700 of those 2,000 would eventually go on to be arrested and put into camps or put to death. Nine, corporate powers protected, mutually beneficial business and government relationship. Mussolini had an interesting form of government. It was called corporatism. It wasn't capitalism. It wasn't communism. It wasn't socialism or whatever. It was corporatism where the major companies in the country 
come together and write policy for the state that's mutually beneficial, basically. Literally the worst qualities of capitalism packaged into one thing. So Mussolini says fascism should more properly be called corporatism because it's the merger of state and corporate power. Now, that I mean, it's... You know, he said that, but it's a lot more complicated than that, obviously. 10. Labor power is suppressed. Labor unions are seen as a huge threat to a fascist government. Labor unions are either severely suppressed or are eliminated entirely. 11. Disrespect for intellectuals in the arts. Open hostility to higher education. Professors and other academics are censored or even arrested. Free expression in the arts and writing is openly attacked. In Germany, 1937, there's a traveling exhibit of degenerate art intended to drum up public disdain for modern styles. Pieces were hung willy-nilly in poor lit rooms with mocking graffiti all over the walls. Yep. And uh, they were crooked. The, the paintings were crooked. And the event was supposed to be 18 plus only, no children. But they allowed children in anyway because they wanted to show them degenerate art. It wasn't, it was just normal art, like Picasso and stuff. Oh my God. It just Hitler hated any art that wasn't his, I guess. Obsession with crime and punishment. Local police are given almost limitless power to enforce laws. People are often willing to overlook police abuses in the name of patriotism. Often a national police force with virtually unlimited power. And we have two more slides here. Rampant cronyism and corruption. Friends and associates appoint each other to government positions. Officials use government power and authority to protect their friends from accountability. And finally, fraudulent elections. Elections are often a complete sham. Elections may be manipulated by smear campaigns, manipulation of the media to control elections, and occasional assassination of opposition candidates. Uh, there is one thing that I can say I, I've, I have not seen any evidence for, and that is Hitler always accepted election results. He never claimed that there was something, some funny business going on, to my surprise. He obviously killed opposition candidates and or, you know, oppositional voices to him anyway. He manipulated the media nonstop. That was like his whole thing. So, yeah, everything else on this list he did, but not those. Anyway, fascism is kind of like the definition of right wing, like extreme far right wing, as far as I can tell. Like I listed off some things that I consider to be right wing and this hits all the check boxes. This is when you go far enough right, this is what you hit, right? So let's listen to Dinesh D'Souza talk about fascism. He's a fascist. For decades, this has been a favorite smear of the left aimed at those on the right. Every Republican president, for that matter, virtually every Republican. I know what he's about to do. He pulls this trick every time. He refers to Republicans as a means of getting around left and right because there's a party switch. He shouldn't be talking about Republican presidents. Every Republican should be talking about left wing presidents or right wing presidents. He knows what he's doing here. Abraham Lincoln was a Republican that was on the left because Republicans were left wing. Democrats were run by the KKK for centuries, like from the very beginning all the way to 1960 or 70 or somewhere in there. Every Republican president, for that matter, virtually every Republican, since the 1970s has been called a fascist. Yeah. Now more than ever. This label is based on the idea that fascism is a phenomenon of the political right. It is, absolutely. Like I said, I guess it depends on your definition, but I feel I've laid out my case pretty succinctly, right? The left says it is, and some self-styled white supremacists and neo-Nazis embrace the label. But are they correct? Yes. To answer this question, we have to ask what fascism really means. What is its underlying ideology? Where does it even come from? These are not easy questions to answer. No, they're pretty easy to answer. I mean, I just answered them all. It took me like five minutes. We know the name of the philosopher of capitalism, Adam Smith. We know the name of the philosopher of Marxism, Karl Marx. OK, I didn't know Adam Smith, actually. And why are we talking about economic systems like capitalism and Marxism? We were talking about like political ideology, not economic policy, right? Germany had a completely different economic policy from Italy, Com completely different. They're not even comparable practically. So I'm not sure why he's even bringing these two up. 
But who's the philosopher of fascism? Yes, exactly. You don't know. Don't feel bad. Almost no one knows. This is not because he doesn't exist, but because historians, most of whom are on the political left, had to erase him from history in order to avoid confronting fascism's actual beliefs. Conspiracy theory nonsense. Just complete BS. There is no evidence presented. There, in fact, there's no evidence that anybody's trying to suppress anything at all. So let me introduce him to you. His name is Giovanni Gentile. Born in 1875, he was one of the world's most influential philosophers in the first half of the 20th century. He was a philosopher and he was Italian, I believe. And he also worked in the fascist Italian government. Gentile believed that there were two diametrically opposed types of democracy. One. OK, I don't know what the hell Gentile believed or whatever. I don't know why that's relevant. That's not how the term is even used. Did he even invent fascism for that matter? I think he was a fascist, uh, you know, a self-proclaimed fascist or whatever. But Dinesh D'Souza is doing that thing that he always does. He's taking definitions that were used like 100 years ago by a very narrow set of people and claiming that that's what it has always meant and that's what it means today. That's not the case, obviously. He's a propagandist. His liberal democracy, such as that of the United States, which Gentile dismisses as individualistic. Liberal is, again, being used differently than is commonly, than it is often used. This is, once again, Dinesh D'Souza twisting words around and making things up. It's just what he does. Gentile believed that there were two diametrically opposed types of democracy. One is liberal democracy, such as that of the United States, which Gentile dismisses as individualistic, too centered on liberty and personal rights, and therefore selfish. The other, the one Gentile recommends, is true democracy, in which individuals willingly subordinate themselves to the state. Again, like, I don't know how much of this is true, this specific thing. I doubt pretty much everything, and you should too. Like his philosophical mentor, Karl Marx, Gentile wanted to create a community that resembles the family. You, you catching what he just did there? He's tying the dude into Karl Marx because he knows that anybody watching this video is automatically going to hate Karl Marx, probably. It's the family, a community where we are all in this together. It's easy to see the attraction of this idea. Indeed, it remains a common rhetorical theme of the left. For example, at the 1984 convention of the Democratic Party, the governor of New York, Mario Cuomo, likened America to an extended family. OK, wow. So his argument is that the creator of fascism felt that family was important. And Mario Cuomo, a governor in the United States, felt like family was important. And so they're both fascists as a result, right? Are you serious with this? How does anybody believe this? Where, through the government, people all take care of each other. Nothing's changed. 30 years later, a slogan of the 2012 Democratic Party convention was, the government is the only thing we all belong to. Okay, I've never heard that before. Is that real? Is he just like making this up? Who would ever say something like that? Hang on, let me see. The government is the only thing we all belong to. Is he saying like the United States is the only thing? Like, what the hell does this mean? From Republican presidential nominee Mitt Romney to radio talk show host Rush Limbaugh, Republicans have been denouncing the following line from a video played in September during the DNC in Charlotte, North Carolina. Government's the only thing we all be belong to. There was like a whole five minute conversation leading up to it, apparently. I'm not sure who these people are, Hunt and Nat, talking to each other. Or Gant, I'm sorry, Hunt and Gant. Gant says, I guess the most important thing is that you can come here and you can get involved and people welcome you and they embrace you and you can come from Charleston, South Carolina and in the space of 15 years be the mayor of the city or you can come from a single parent family and become the mayor here. That's always going to be, for me, what's the greatest thing about Charlotte. It's people making it possible. And then Hunt says to him, we're committed to all people. We do believe you could use government in a good way. Government's the only thing that we belong to, as in we're, you know, you're a Christian, you're a Muslim, you're a Sikh, you're a Buddhist, but we're all Americans. That's what they meant by that. We have different churches, different clubs, but we're together as, as part of our city or our county or our state. 
and our nation. That That's the context here. He's trying to make it out like Marxism, communism, and fascism are all the same thing. Like, that's complete ahistorical nonsense. It is so ridiculous that I can't believe he's even saying it. It's an embarrassment. But that's the thing about Dinesh D'Souza. He knows he can say literally anything and people will believe him, no matter what it is. He can talk about Nazis being communists and people would believe it, even though they were like diametrically opposed. They were on opposite ends of the spectrum. They hated each other, but he can say it and people believe it. They might as well have been quoting Gentile. Now, remember, Gentile was a man of the left. He was a committed socialist. I don't remember that. What are you talking about? Was he on the left? And what is socialist in his mind? At the time, socialist really only meant you're in favor of social programs like pensions and unemployment insurance, you know, universal health care and, oh, my God, just a billion other things. Now, remember, Gentile was a man of the left. He was a committed socialist. For Gentile, fascism is a form of socialism. Indeed, its most workable form. I don't know what he's talking about here. While the socialism of Marx mobilizes people on the basis of class, fascism mobilizes people by appealing to their national identity as well as their class. That this is all just lies, like all of it. It's completely fabricated. Dude can say literally anything, and people believe this. Fascists are socialists with a national identity. German fascists in the 1930s were called Nazis, basically a contraction of the term national socialist. That's true. But again, socialism at the time was being in favor of social welfare programs. It wasn't a form of communism. It wasn't like a stepping stone to communism the way that people envision it now or, the, like, you know, the right envisions it. That's not how it was interpreted at all. The national portion of National Socialist was a reference to extreme nationalism an extreme far right fundamental deep belief that you were special because you are German, you're Aryan, there's something unique about you on a spiritual level. It wasn't just like, you know, you're a, a better race. It's not just that you are bred well. It's that you are anointed effectively. It's a mystical, religious, super uh, supernatural claim. That's how Germans kind of viewed the national portion of National Socialist. And again, socialist just meant you were like part of the Workers' Party. Like Donald Trump does the exact same thing when he's shouting out to the working poor or the middle class or whatever. Doesn't even really do that anymore, but he used to in 2016. For Gentile, all private action should be oriented to serve society. There's no distinction between the private interest and the public interest. Okay, I don't know about Gentile. I don't know if he even believes this. I doubt it. But so what? He may have had an idea of fascism in his mind. That's not what fascism is correctly understood, the two are identical. And who is the administrative arm of society? It's none other than the state. Consequently, to submit to society is to submit to the state, not... Like, this isn't even how fascism worked back then. I don't even know what he's talking about right now. Gentile may have believed this stuff, but this is not how it played out at all. He's like one in, like, a sea of a billion other people who believe this. Gentile, if Dinesh D'Souza is to be believed, was the only one who viewed fascism this way. Like, literally no other person viewed it this way. Not just in economic matters, but in all matters. Since everything is political, the state gets to tell everyone how to think and what to do. It was another Italian, Benito Mussolini, the fascist dictator of Italy from 1922 to 1943. Yeah, okay, so he's very clearly right-wing, Mussolini was, and... Hitler is also very clearly right wing. There's a clear delineation there. How's he going to spin this into Mussolini being left wing, I wonder? Who turned Gentile's words into action. In his Dottrina del Fascismo, one of the doctrinal statements of early fascism, Mussolini wrote, All is in the state and nothing human exists or has value outside the state. He was... Okay, again, I don't believe a word out of his mouth, so just don't believe even trivial stuff. Look it up. Everything. Merely paraphrasing Gentile. The Italian philosopher is now lost in obscurity. 
but his f- because he was irrelevant. He was always irrelevant to history. But it, you can look it up. Like no one's hiding this information. He's on Wikipedia. But his philosophy could not be more relevant because it closely parallels that of the modern left. Gentile's work speaks directly to progressives who champion the centralized state. No. What are you talking about? Nobody wants centralized state. We want democracy. The left is not in favor of centralized, condensed power. No one wants this. Consolidated power or whatever. Do you know who wants it? People on the right. The Heritage Foundation. Project 2025 is creating a pathway to centralize power and consolidate this, the power into the hands of like a, a very few pe- or very few people, just like a few, uh, just a handful of people, the president and maybe a few others. That's it. So he's just like he's making things up right now. He's just lying. Eight. Here in America, the left has vastly expanded state control over the private sector, from healthcare to banking, from education to energy. This state-directed capitalism is precisely what German and Italian fascists implemented in the 1930s. No, no, it isn't. Their economies could not possibly be any different. And again, why are we talking about economies? Fascism is not an economic policy. Leftists can't acknowledge their man Gentile because that would undermine their attempt to bind conservatism to fascism. Conservatism wants small government so that individual liberty can flourish. Really? Individual liberty? So you're in favor of gay people like getting married and stuff because it's their individual liberty to do so? You're okay with people getting abortions because it's their liberty to do so, their choice, right? Small government? You're uh, opposed to government banning birth control. You're opposed to the government controlling the borders. Just throw them wide open, right? Because the government shouldn't be involved in anything, pretty much. Small government. So small, quote unquote, that I can drown it in a bathtub. As uh, I think, who said that? Was that Newt Gingrich said that? These people are just lying. They're lying. They're like fabricating this whole thing. The left, like Gentile, wants the opposite, to place the resources of the individual and industry in the service of a centralized state. To acknowledge Gentile... No, I don't want that. I don't know what the hell he's talking about. I want democracy. Spread power out, create checks and balances. That's what the left is in the United States. In fact, on a world stage, that's the left today. Centralized state. To acknowledge Gentile is to acknowledge that fascism bears a deep kinship to the ideology of today's left. No. So they will keep Gentile where they've got him, dead, buried, and forgotten. But we should remember, or the ghost of fascism will continue to haunt us. I'm Dinesh D'Souza for Prager University. This dude is such a liar. It's painfully embarrassing that he can just flagrantly make it up like this. This is nuts. Dennis Prager did a video titled, Was Hitler Far Right or Far Left? And I figured it'd be worth it to talk about it because it's kind of an interesting subject, heavily related. Just check this video out. Dennis, I'd like your perspective on whether you think Hitler was far right or was actually a far left ideologue. Okay, thank you for your time. I enjoy listening to Fireside Chat every week. Fireside chat. (laughs) Yeah, Dennis Prager has a fireside chat also. We talked about what fascism is. And uh, as far as I can tell, that's like the quintessential example of the right, what the right is. Hyper-religious, toughness, being an alpha male, fewer social programs, centralized power, superiority, patriotism, law and order, traditionalism, so on and so forth. That's right wing. That I just described like literally everything that Hitler wanted. All the best. Thank you. Hitler uh, was uh, was left wing in that he believed uh, in socialism. Remember, Nazism. Oh, my God. This is such a tired talking point, bro. Socialism is not synonymous with communism the way that they keep portraying here. I, I'm not I don't even feel the need to go back to this. Like, this is just such nonsense. So it's Grover Norquist. He said he wants the government to be as so small he can drown in a bathtub. My mistake. Grover Norquist. Remember, Nazism is national socialism. Very few people know that, especially. 
Really? Okay. You go to college where you don't learn much. Oh yeah. So go to college and you you know less than you would if you didn't go to college. See, they extract information from your brain. That makes sense. Okay. So people would have known that it meant National Socialist if they hadn't gone to college. Go on. Very few people know that, especially if you go to college where you don't learn much. But that is what Nazism stands for, National Socialism. In that sense, it was left wing. But it No, it was not left wing in any way. It was a nationalist movement that believed in social programs. And honestly, like Germany at the time was pretty far left, actually, like the Weimar Republic, the government that existed before Hitler took over for like 12 years between World War I and World War II. It was pretty far left, actually. It was actually phenomenal. I, I wish we had that system here, to be honest. Like literally everything about that government was fantastic. Women had the right to vote, just like everybody else. They had a Congress, they had a president, they had all the same stuff that the United States has pretty much, except they also had programs where the government was the employer of last resort. So if you couldn't get a job, you could go work for the government, building roads and fixing bridges and things. They didn't pay much, but it would keep the lights on. Everybody got a pension at the end of their lives, kind of like Social Security, except it wasn't being gutted every 15 seconds. Uh, let's see. Unemployment insurance existed. If the housing market had a problem, then the German government came in and, and built extra houses. A lot of the houses that existed were built by the government. And, um, you know, I think there were 64,000 houses built by private industry and government built an additional 35 percent of that, I think in the um, early 30s. I don't I don't remember exact numbers now, but the point is that the Weimar Republic was fantastic. And the German Workers Party, which is actually what it stood for or what it meant, uh, NSDAP was the abbreviation for the, the full name of the political party. They were in favor of social programs like that. But they were also nationalists. They believed that there was something unique and special and supernatural about them. They called themselves the folk, V-O-L-K. And that term held special supernatural meaning within it. So nationalism is why Hitler chose that political party. It didn't really have anything to do with like their political or economic goals. And Hitler didn't follow their political or economic goals at all when he got in anyway. He completely destroyed the economy by ginning up a big war machine. But it was not left wing in another sense. The left divided the world by class. I don't know what, he, what the hell he's talking about. That's the classic Marxist division of the world, class. I, don't know. I mean, there are people of different social classes. What? I mean, communism was the primary enemy of Nazis. Like they were, I don't know, one third of the political voting bloc or something. And then Catholics were in the center and they were roughly one third. And then Nazis were actually a fringe party. They were a protest vote for a long time. And then you had a, you know, a variety of smaller party, like a billion small parties. But the communists separated people on social class and religion and all kinds of different things. What are you going on about right now? Like, this is just made up. Again, they can say whatever they want and just make it up. World class, the proletariat and the, uh, and the oppressor, if you will. Whereas Hitler divided the world by race. Race is not a left wing or a right wing value. No, really, it's not. I mean, just going through this list again, identification of enemies as a unifying cause. People are rallied into a unifying patriotic frenzy over the need to eliminate a perceived common enemy. Racial, ethnic or religious minorities, liberals, communists, socialists, terrorists. And honestly, the elite, those are separated into a, a political class that can be attacked too. you know, class, class warfare. That can be weaponized against people, even on the right. And that's what happened. It has become a left-wing value in, in the last 25 years uh, in the West. All of a sudden, race matters incredibly. The, the, the left had... Okay, now let me clarify what he's doing here. 
race mattered to Hitler in that he believed that he was superior to everybody, exceptional, if you will. Race matters to the left in that the left wants to make everybody equal to everybody else. They want to make everything fair. They want to even things out so that there's full equity in society. That's completely different. That is literal exact opposites of what Hitler did. There is no comparison. He's just like making it up again. Matters incredibly. The, the, the left has actually in some ways abandoned classic Marxist division by class and now made it by race. Uh, but uh, race was neither left nor right until the, the this moment. It is not a right. That's just nonsense. That's complete bull. Race has been used as a uh, tribalistic separator since the dawn of time. I don't know what the hell he's talking about. This moment. It is not a right wing value. I mean, I, uh, I live among people on the right. None, none, none of them. Not one, not, a, not one person I know is a racist. I bet. Totally. They find the idea preposterous. So uh, it, it's not right to say that he was right wing and it's not right to say. Yes, it is. He was right wing. It is absolutely correct to say that. He was right wing and it's not right to say he was only left wing. He was partially left wing. And no, there is nothing left about him. And by the way, he hated capitalism. No, he didn't. Are you kidding me right now? Dude is just making it up. Hitler hated communism and capitalism, actually. Okay, um, he did talk about capitalism a little bit, but it was a capitalist system that he operated under. And I suspect that most of the talking that he did about pretty much anything was to further his own goals and his own power. He also talked about religion sometimes, rarely, when it, when it benefited him. But he also spoke really positively about religion when it benefited him. Anyway. It's obviously vastly, vastly more complicated than he's making it. You cannot say Hitler hated capitalism the way that Dennis Prager did. You can't say that. It's just not that simple. Hated capitalism. Hated it. I just read a, a new biography of Hitler, and that was a... God, I hope we get the name of that so we know what to stay away from, because it's complete bullshit. And that was a major part of the biography, how much the man hated capitalism. That's also not taught in college. It, it's nonsense. Capitalism was the predominant economic policy that opposed to communism. Those were like the two battling economic policies. And Nazis and communists hated each other. It was a matter of fact, it's a book by Richard J. Evans. It talks about this. It's called The Coming of the Third Reich. I know exactly what the quote is. I'm not sure which page this is on because it's an ebook, but it's in the section titled The Terror Begins. It says, the party was well aware that its popularity had faded in the second half of 1932, the Nazi party, obviously, while that of the communists had been growing. Of all their opponents, the Nazis feared and hated the communists most. In countless street battles and meeting hall clashes, the communists had shown that they could trade punch for punch and exchange shot for shot with their brown shirt counterparts. Brown shirts being like the Proud Boys for Hitler, basically. The point is that they were the primary enemy of Nazis. Economically and um, ideologically, and socially, everything. They hated each other. And there is nothing that burns me up more than people just lying about this subject, confidently knowing that nobody will know any better. Like Tim Pool a while back tweeting, Kamala Harris represents the greatest existential threat in the United States. Unelected anti-democratic appointment at the 11th hour by Comucrats, okay? She is Hitler and Stalin combined, but times 200. She's a Comunazi despot come to put conservatives in concentration camps. Communazi. I don't like, there's no, I don't, what word do you even use to describe this? Absurd does not do it. I don't believe that um, Dennis Prager is really this unknowledgeable about the subject. I think he knows what he's doing. I think he knows a lot more about this subject than he's letting on. And he's pretending that Hitler was opposed to capitalism and that he was left wing. It just, it, it kills me that these people just like make it up and be believed. I mean, tell me what you think about it in the comments.